for such a nice introduction, the speaker should learn his ways and say thank you and sit down because nothing else will help you anymore. They have said so many things about me and obviously because it's Sunday and this is as close to church as I'm going to come. Uh, <laughs> Coming here was a, uh, this morning uh, brought very uh, wonderful memories to me. My mother-in-law, uh, Jean Olson, lived here uh, for about eight or nine years. Uh, she passed away a year ago. Uh, but this was a, a route that uh, we did, uh, I did almost every week and my wife did every day and therefore uh, brought very, very nice memories. I was one of the people who can truly say that he loved his mother-in-law. <laughs> I was the one who wanted her to come and live uh, near us uh, when she did. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, California and, and higher education. And since, not because I coordinated it that way, but uh, there's a big article in the news, front of the newspaper and today. Obviously, the newspaper doesn't have much else to write about. Uh, about Sonoma State and Ben and all that. I'll talk a little bit about that and about some of the programs we're involved in. But in terms of public higher education, probably the, uh, there are three major episodes that uh, made a profound uh, difference in the way uh, higher education happens in the United States. And in some ways uh, has become the envy of uh, the world uh, who has a lot much older uh, universities. We tend to forget how young we are compared uh, to the world. Uh, you know, the University of Salamanca, University of Paris, uh, uh, Oxford, uh, are, you know, where all universities, when the pilgrims come to the United States, and we have our own, uh, all these institutions, Harvard University is comparatively young compared to a lot of the European universities. But in most of other countries, public higher education has not been as strong as we have in the United States, and in many cases, uh, don't have the same tradition. But this, for the United States, became fairly early. Uh, in 1962, uh, just about the beginning of the Civil War, uh, President <coughs> Lincoln sa signed the Morrill uh, Act. The Morrill Act, then it became the Land Grant Act, where every state uh, at that time got to own a substantial amount of land, uh, 20,000 acres per each member of Congress at that time, uh, to establish a public institution uh, who would have as its core uh, the expansion of research in the areas at that time primarily of a education, engineering, and agriculture. Without, and this had to be put in to convince some people to vote for it, without uh, excluding uh, military aid training. And out of that comes your great state universities, your Michigan State uh, University, University of Georgia, uh, you, you know, the grand California, the University of California is a land grant uh, university. And it really brought, and many of these universities were located in pre rural areas uh, at that time because that's where you have a lot of available land. But it brought a great deal of uh, open spaces for students who were not going to be going to your principal private universities, most at that time in the eastern uh, seaboard, uh, to enter uh, higher education. 
and to work in, in fields which were at that time uh, not necessarily the liberal arts or the humanities, but the technology areas. Uh, and out of that probably comes one of the greatest revolutions in economic life of this country, which is our agricultural revolution, where we become, uh, in a fairly short period of time, the most productive agricultural country uh, in the world. And uh, a lot of the technology about uh, agriculture and becoming massive level of agriculture comes from the development of the land-grant colleges. And with that also, in areas of engineering and tried also to uh, teach education, even though many schools had normal uh, schools, etc. For that was a great change in how the public uh, university uh, developed a research-based area in uh, a very important part of that. And remember, this is just as we start. Uh, the, uh, the Civil War. Not what you would call the easiest time to get something of that done. But it's one of the things that uh, President Lincoln signs and it's not probably, not many people associate Lincoln with education in that sense, but indeed was very, very important uh, to the development of the land grant code. Then, in 1944, uh, uh, the United States signs the GI Bill, uh, where we have a, the ability to provide basically what we call to these days financial aid to the returning uh, veterans from World War II. And the numbers were enormous, the level of uh, demographics changed significantly. These were not, uh, in many cases, uh, people who had come from privileged backgrounds, who could afford uh, the uh, more expensive private universities. Uh, and it really transformed the educational level of the United States with the returning veterans getting a, a, a higher education, college degrees. Uh, it, it really pushed this country uh, again into the development of its technological uh, infrastructure. And you know, that period after the war, while Europe is having uh, severe reconstruction uh, issues after a very devastating war, etc., the United States becomes also not only a military superpower, but an intellectual uh, superpower. And a great deal of that happens because of the education we provided to the uh, returning veterans in the GI Bill. And we have had some form of GI Bill ever since. One of the real challenges that just came from Washington, D.C. Uh, last night and uh, met uh, with the Secretary of Defense, uh, Leon Panetta. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges uh, that we uh, are encountering and we'll, we'll be working on, and the California State University is at the forefront of it, is providing uh, a level of higher education to our returning soldiers from both Iraq and Afghanistan. And by the way, California is one of the major entry point from, for those returning uh, military men uh, and women. And, uh, and they need to, uh, many of them, uh, to be honest, enlist uh, because of the educational opportunities that they will have upon uh, finishing their military services. Uh, but not as many use it as they are available for it. Mm. And a lot of it, 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 it is used by them going to uh, for-profit type institutions where the level of retention and graduation 
is not as, as good as, uh, as we can be, but, but, but they are very service oriented. Education anytime, anywhere, any place. Uh, and the more uh, stated institutions uh, uh, are not as uh, agile in doing that as, uh, as we should be, and we are working on that. I have to tell you, I was, uh, not too long ago, uh, I was in Camp Pendleton uh, with a number of university presidents, uh, and we visited, especially with wounded uh, warriors. And, and I have to tell you, I am so, uh, have such admiration for these young men and women uh, who have served in these two long and difficult uh, wars, and many of them have been profoundly wounded, uh, but their level of interest in rebuilding their lives and have no level of bitterness whatsoever, and some of the most optimistic people that I have ever met, it really is uh, heartwarming. Uh, to the highest degree. For, but we now have in higher education the challenge of how to give these returning people from Iraq, Iran, uh, and uh, not Iran, yet, uh, Iraq <laughs> and Afghanistan uh, the, uh, the education uh, that uh, they need to be provided. I am personally very uh, keen to that because uh, I have a son uh, who's a Navy officer and uh, you know one of the reasons he uh, did that was uh, because of the educational uh, opportunities and uh, made, a, made a career uh, in the Navy. Uh, it's, it's now uh, you know, about to be gone for a year uh, uh, back to the Middle East. Uh, but not to the, uh, it's, the, it's more of the area of support for what's happened, not for actually comeback. But education became a, a, something he really thought was very important and indeed uh, has acquired a terrific level of education uh, while in the serving uh, for the nation. The third sort of episode, uh, and the more relevant to what we're talking about today, was in California in the 1960s uh, with the establishment of the Master Plan for Higher Education. Uh, two things happened in the 1960s which are sort of interesting. Uh, one is the consolidation of many normal schools, uh, people like San Jose State, San Francisco State, San Diego State, uh, into a new system called the California State uh, University, uh, which now has 23 institutions, Sonoma State being one of those uh, institutions. And, uh, and secondly, uh, and, and, and with that came not only the creation of the system by uh, bringing some of the, uh, what were their normal schools primarily, uh, and also the creation of new uh, universities uh, in places like uh, Ronald Park uh, or Sonoma State University, again, in 1960, uh, gets created, and you have places like CSU Bakersfield uh, and others, uh, CSU Stanislaus, uh, CSU Fullerton, etc. <coughs> and who now uh, have a combined enrollment of over 400,000 students. And the other part of that was the uh, establishment of the master plan uh, for higher education, uh, which had uh, a number of components, but principally to that is that in California, there would have be uh, one of the principles that there would be a place in higher education for every Californian who wanted it to go. And it established a three uh, distinctive uh, segments 
one, the community colleges. Uh, at that time, there were the junior colleges. And, uh, that word, uh, junior colleges, has sort of disappeared, uh, except in two places, uh, one of which is at, uh, here in Santa Rosa, where we remain at Santa Rosa Junior College. Uh, most other places dropped the word junior and became community as sort of their mission expanded to be more self transferring institutions. And these community colleges were to uh, accept, they had an open admissions policy. It was to accept any student who graduated from a, a high school, they would be able to come uh, to a, one of the now 104 different community colleges that we have. Are all about the state. Every county, in some form or another, or nearby, has one of those. The second uh, set of institutions uh, would accept students who would graduate from the top third of their uh, graduating class, and those were the state universities, the California State Universities. Uh, again, spread throughout the state. Uh, as close uh, to the Oregon border as you could get with Humboldt State, and as close to the Mexican border as you could get uh, called San Diego State University, and everything in between. With a very heavy concentration of a number of campuses in the Southern California, in the Southern California uh, who really had the bulk of the population. And the third segment of that was the University of California, now with 10 campuses. Some of them are relatively new. Uh, UC Santa Cruz is as, uh, it was established exactly the same year as Sonoma State uh, had, but also a new campus was only about four years old at UC uh, Merced. And there would be, a, uh, their function uh, would be to accept students who would graduate from the top eight to 12 and a half percent of the graduating class and also a very strong uh, <coughs> research uh, emphasis, uh, original research, uh, pure research. Uh, well, the uh, California State University was more involved in more practical uh, applied uh, research. The second principle, aside from that of access, uh, we have been and uh, one of uh, dis uh, distinctiveness of mission. And for instance, uh, only the University of California has medical schools and law schools uh, and veterinary schools. Uh, and until recently, recent as only uh, two or three years, three years ago, they were only, only the University of California within the public sector uh, was able to grant uh, doctoral degrees. That has uh, changed a little bit, and now the California State University can offer uh, doctors in, uh, in education, and most recently, not fully studied yet, in uh, uh, occupational therapy uh, and uh, 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 things for the hearing uh, impairment. I think that areas that the University of California has placed uh, uh, are more applied than what they do. Therefore, there was a very distinctive, clear mission for these three segments. And the last, uh, uh, the other piece of that was uh, that it would be, uh, as part of that, it would be that at all of these three segments, there will be very much a concept of high quality. Access, high quality, the third school of the master plan was affordable, so it would be affordable. And indeed, even though prices have increased uh, in the last uh, years, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, uh, the affordability of California higher education, public higher education, is still very much uh, compared to other states and uh, and the private institutions. Uh, to give you an example, uh, what we call tuition and fees 
uh, a place like Sonoma State University, it's about a little over six thousand uh, dollars a year. Uh, Stanford is uh, uh, almost sixty thousand uh, dollars a year, uh, and even the University of California is only about eleven thousand uh, dollars compared again to private universities, etc. University of California, primarily uh, Berkeley and UC, uh, UCLA, rank among the top universities uh, in the world. Uh, so, so Berkeley has more uh, Nobel Prizes uh, than, any, than many other institutions on any the, uh, west of, uh, of, the East, of Harvard University. This is a footnote just to that uh, I, uh, to show you what is really valued at many uh, universities, uh, and sometimes you think it's academics, uh, some of us who deal with it uh, know better, the, what the sine qua non of university is parking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you, if you uh, if you earn a Nobel Prize at the uh, University of California Berkeley, what you get, the most prized possession is you get your own designated parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, uh, if you walk around the uh, University of California Berkeley and you see a reserved parking space with the world in L, Nobel laureate, and you find that that is the prices possession uh, uh, at the university. Uh, the fellow who created a, a was in charge of the master plan uh, for higher education, uh, Clark Kirk. At one time, uh, you know, he was not only a very uh, outstanding labor uh, economist, uh, but he also wrote a great deal and thought a great deal about uh, this new phenomenon which he called uh, the American uh, University, the American Public uh, University. And one of his definitions of what the university was, he says that it was uh, this conglomerate of different interests, sometimes warring in, in, uh, interests, uh, United by the common uh, the common right of the lack of adequate parking, <laughs> and he, then he described adequate parking as parking uh, within uh, 400 yards, uh, 400 feet from where you want to be at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and therefore, uh, no no university would be able to have uh, that uh, available. And to this day, no matter where you are, and one of the things that every president gets is uh, a lot of complaints because of parking. Uh, I can assure you that at Sonoma State University, I get the same complaints, but we have more parking uh, available than uh, most other institutions. Uh, and there's a formula for that. And we are really, really, compared to places like San Francisco State and others, we have plenty, plenty of parking, but you want that parking where you can see your car, like I said, at 10 in the morning when everybody else comes. Uh, therefore, this concept of affordability had, was very important. And what the master plan for higher education did was, again, this <coughs> creation from, and, and tied to the creation of the GI Bill of making California, a very important place for the value of education. And indeed, as the economy of the state changed from a labor-intensive, agriculturally-based uh, economy to a more intellectually-based economy, you need highly educated, trained individuals. The days where you could do well uh, by how strong 
your back where and how strong your arms and legs were, uh, those days are gone. Those jobs are gone. You know, and especially in this state, uh, after the end of the Cold War, and we shifted from a, a state whose economy was very dependent upon the defense industry, and we had lots of factories who were involved in the defense uh, industry, uh, building airplanes and rockets, etc., uh, to a more service-oriented industry, one of the key ingredients is what uh, Robert Reich, the uh, former Secretary of Labor uh, in the Clinton uh, administration, uh, described as the knowledge worker. Not some, uh, somebody who's really a strong Things have a strong of a arms and legs and back, but it had a very strong adaptive brain and could incorporate a great deal of knowledge in, and to be able to, to do that. One of the things that therefore California began to do, it was a great importer of that. And you know, California became uh, the sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, uh, right there with, you know, with France and uh, other countries. We now have slipped uh, a bit uh, because this state has had some serious economic problems which have, done, which have affected uh, the state of education. And indeed, as Tom said, I have been here now uh, a number of years uh, as president of the university and I think for men, for most of these years, especially in the more recent years, uh, the world budget cut has become uh, what, I, what I deal with uh, every day and what keeps me awake uh, many nights. Uh, how do you provide that high level, quality, affordable education with a significant uh, reduction in the state uh, support uh, for those uh, for the students. Uh, when I came here to uh, Sonoma State, uh, the students were paying uh, less than a thousand dollars in tuition. Uh, with, like I said, now they are going to be paying uh, about six thousand beginning uh, next fall. Compared to the rest of the public universities in the country, we are still, in the California State University, the lowest price in the, in the 50 states. Uh, and that includes uh, my uh, adopted uh, home state of Texas, uh, who has had a fairly good endowment uh, system for some of the, for the public universities, for the University of Texas, and for the Texas A&M uh, system. Because uh, when Texas became a uh, joint <coughs> the union, uh, then, of course, they went to, uh, they had some lands that they didn't know what to do. Uh, and they, uh, the federal, the, the, the federal government didn't want to do, and they decided, you know, these are absolutely worthless lands. They are in the panhandle, that's desert, you have scrub, high, no higher than these, or they are in these swamps in the, uh, on the coastal side, uh, and nobody wants to do anything there. There was this new little institution called the University of Texas, what, you know, uh, perhaps they can, you know, we'll give it to them because it's politically neutral. And nobody would argue that. And that and the, and the agreement uh, said Texas could not be divided except by the vote of the citizens of Texas uh, happened, you know, uh, <coughs> Texas joined the union. Well, years later, in this wasteland, they found these things called oil and gas. <laughs> and in the, uh, and especially also from that in the sunlands 
uh, around the coast. And uh, Texas has a uh, the, the, the Texas has a huge uh, endowment that they never value at current market value because if that if they do that, they'd be even higher than that <coughs> of uh, Harvard University. But how do you provide this kind of education with this uh, uh, significant budget reduction? It's uh, it's a challenge. It is a very significant uh, challenge. Just to give you uh, an example, uh, this this year, the year we're in, uh, the uh, state uh, has reduced our budget by about uh, six hundred seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Hmm. That is a drop in one year, twenty nine percent. Those of you who were business people and ran orga business organizations, if in one year you lose almost 30% of your revenue, you go on. I mean, you literally go on. Uh, we haven't gone on uh, We still provide uh, a very good education, but it is under severe strains. And there's a strong, uh, there's a strong possibility that uh, we will lose another uh, 200 million dollars uh, coming up uh, in uh, January 1st if the these tax uh, proposals that Governor Brown has put forward uh, is not uh, approved. There are different questions about uh, how feasible that uh, is going uh, to be. Uh, and, it, and as I said recently, that is a self-inflicting wound for this state because we are getting more dependent upon highly educated, highly trained workforce uh, who, who only is created by education than uh, otherwise. And therefore, as you constrain that supply of education, both in terms of the funding you have for quality, but also the numbers of it, uh, we are under enrollment restrictions. I can today have a thousand more students than I have if I have the state funding. And if you do that, in this technological uh, economy, I think what you're doing that is simply hurting the future of, of, of the state uh, significantly. And uh, I think that's something that I'm not sure that the present government understands uh, uh, well enough. Uh, and I'm very, very uh, concerned. Um, let me, before I talk about other things, uh, let me talk a little bit about, there's an, an article in today's paper about the uh, death of the university and etc. And I think Jeremy Hayes did a, a very good job, I didn't think it, the whole thing deserves a, a front page. I used to be in the media business. Uh, Obviously, there's not much else happening, even though I thought there were an election happening, etc. Uh, but I'm not uh, at all uh, apologetic about uh, the debt the university has incurred. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, about, I'll give you a, a, a little bit of a story about why and when I came in 1992, Sonoma State University uh, was an institution uh, who had had enrollment problems. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the 1980s, uh, uh, while the state was in pretty good, uh, doing pretty well, uh, 
Sonoma State was the, one of the, uh, was the only institution who had uh, did a set of layoff of faculty, and it was not because of budget, but it was because there was not enough students uh, to the institution. And the students who were coming uh, to us were mostly local, uh, older, uh, and would take two courses. You get funded for students taking basically five courses, uh, etc. Or we had an enrollment uh, uh, problem. Enrollment. One of the issues in this area is we are not, in the area, a very heavy producer of young people. Uh, if I look around <laughs> this room, I don't think any of us is planning to have, I don't know about there, it looks like a young group, young couple there. Uh, but, you know, uh, we are not, we don't produce in this area uh, many college-bound uh, young people. Uh, and that's an issue. Therefore, the uh, university uh, had to do some things. And I tell the story that I came in, in uh, July of 92, and in October of 92, uh, the chancellor, we, 92 begins sort of the downsizing of uh, California higher education. That's one of the low trough in terms of state funding. Uh, and and um, the chancellor at that time, uh, Barry Munich, uh, commented that perhaps uh, one of the strategies that we needed to be followed was closing of a couple of campuses. And he named Sonoma State as one of those. So that was not the most reassuring thing for a, somebody who had been there less than a uh, five months, so I'm still trying to learn where the bathrooms uh, uh, were. Uh, you know, this is like, uh, you are not told, when you, when you get a job like this, most of the time, you are really not told the full story. Uh, except by, you know, you are told only the good stuff. Uh, but I remember the day after I became president, I was still not here. I was still in the southern part of the United States. My vice president for finance and administration was still my vice president for finance and administration. He and I are the two oldest uh, administrators around. Uh, Larry Schlesser came to see me and after congratulating me, says, you know, Dr. Mignana, by the time you get there, uh, beginning on July 1st, I have to tell you, we won't have enough money to buy toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think we have an issue. Uh, we might offer the best education uh, possible, uh, but the health department will, will close the joint if we cannot provide toilet paper. We had to, in very few days, figure out how to buy toilet paper, uh, you know, and do other things. Uh, by the university to, to do that. But what became obvious uh, to us is that uh, Sonoma State needed to uh, reposition itself in terms of attracting students. Uh, and that they were not local. And local for us is a fairly large area. It includes the counties of Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino, Lake, <coughs> Uh, uh, Solano and Marin County. Uh, therefore, sort of on a land base, we look big, but in terms of population, uh, ongoing po uh, student population, not uh, very big. But we have to figure out how to attract students. And the way to attract students from outside, had to be from outside the area. And that required housing. Uh, Ronner Park is not a college town. It's not a Chico, where you have lots of college uh, ability, etc. for us to provide uh, housing. 
just to give you a reference, at the incoming freshman level, 80% of our students come from outside that area. And if you look at where our freshmen come from, and we get about 1,800 freshmen every year, uh, one of the principal areas in this order, they come from San, the San Diego County, LA County, uh, and then we get uh, Orange County. That is one of the principal centers of students uh, to us. Then we get a, lot, a number of students, a lot of students from the South Bay area, Santa Clara County, Contra Costa County, that area. Then the third area we get is the sort of the local area, and then the fourth area we get students is from the uh, Sacramento East uh, area, from lots of small towns, uh, etc. But 80% of our students at the freshman level, this is not home, and you have to provide them. More interestingly, at the transfer level, 60% of the students also do not come from the local area. They come from outside the local area. For housing, those students became essential to attracting them. And we proceeded to do that, uh, create, and we did that <coughs> deliberately, and I have to tell you, our housing for students is terrific. Uh, most of them live in apartments, for students to an apartment. Uh, most of them have a bedroom, a single bedroom, or sometimes a double bedroom, but many of them are single bedrooms. They share a fully, fully equipped kitchen, including dishwasher and garbage disposals and uh, also a regular uh, oven and a convention oven. Uh, and they share a, a living room. And each one has its own, each room has its own individual bath. I'm 64, almost 65 years old. I share a bedroom. I share a bathroom, <laughs> and I fight and lose for uh, very little closet space. <laughs> Therefore, I tell uh, our students who live in housing that uh, the, uh, their standard of living uh, is going to go down uh, after graduation. <laughs> For what they pay, you don't get that in San Francisco <laughs> or LA, uh, etc. Uh, and we went from less than uh, 400 beds uh, to 4,000 beds uh, in a short period of time. In the way we operate in the California State University, uh, you, the state, don't, cannot pay for housing. Uh, the students uh, pay for housing, and therefore what you do is you borrow money at a very, very competitive uh, rate uh, through the system. And it's really not the university, it's the system who borrows the money. And what you do is pay the mortgage, the bonds, uh, based upon the student's uh, uh, payment, uh, monthly payment. Except you pledge your student revenue, housing revenue, against the payment of the bonds. And that's how it is. When you have that, and you have that, and we went literally from a, being a, a total community campus to now we house 40% of our students within the university. And if you count the students who live within a mile, a mile and a half radius, over 85%, 88% of the students live within a mile of the We have become a real residential campus. Uh, and that was not what it was uh, before. Once you do that, the students want to have certain amenities. 
uh, and, and, and the students voted, and they paid for it. They take elections, and they vote uh, to uh, uh, increase their fee. They wanted very much to have a red center. Uh, and I have to tell you, the most popular building on campus is not the, the, the classroom building, it's the rec center. We had some furloughs a year ago where we closed most of the universities, but the students asked to keep up, interestingly enough, was not the library, but they wanted the rec center open, and, and we had to do that. And now we're opening a university center, which also will have uh, a lot of uh, uh, places for the students to meet, to eat, uh, bookstores, and things of that nature. That is part of what a modern university is all about. The days when I went to school, I li you could li we live in a dormitory uh, with bathrooms uh, down the hall, way up there. Those days are gone. Most of our students do not know that way of life. They have lived, they have learned from, they have grown, you know, where they live there in their own bedrooms and they have their own bathrooms, they have their own, not just television, but now one of the major costs of a, of a university now is you have to have a lot of energy coming to this uh, facility because you have so much electronics. Uh, built uh, in. And of course, that is also changing uh, in most recent years. Therefore, uh, that's why you get into debt. Uh, but it is not the debt of the university, it's the debt of the system. And it is all, all, all backed by the students' ability. Not a penny of it by law from the academic side can go to pay that housing. Uh, or recreation debt. If I would put a penny of that from well, from the academic side into that, there are only two people at university who go to jail. One is the president, and the other is the vice president for finance. And we are not intending to, to do that. We're both too young and cute. <laughs> for that's what it's all about. Also, what the other thing the university has done in the uh, more recent years is a reorientation uh, toward the community. Uh, in my estimation, Sonoma State was uh, fairly isolated from its community, uh, you know, uh, some years ago. A lot of good things were happening uh, inside, but, you know, not that much. And out of that, Reorientation came things like the Lifelong Learning uh, Institute, uh, dealing with a different population, uh, and, be able, and, and teaching not only in the university, but places like Ottman and Napa, etc. Therefore, a, 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 a different re reorientation uh, to that. Uh, also, as Tom said, looking into areas where the university had not done before. Uh, we had no engagement uh, with the wine uh, industry a number of years ago. Uh, and one of the most important industries in this area. Now, we were not going to compete with Davis about uh, the agricultural side, and we're not going to compete with Fresno about the production side. Therefore, we developed a very, very key, important niche uh, in our relationship to the wine business, and it was through the wine business. We don't produce, we don't teach you how to grow a grape, or how uh, to produce a bottle of wine. What we have become the world experts on is on the marketing of wine, on the accounting of wine, uh, on the legal side of wine, which is a very complicated side. Therefore, it is we develop a niche in the wine business, 
rather than the production. To the point that we are, and interestingly enough, when we started this, there were no academic works in that field at all. And we have been at Sonoma State, the principal creator of uh, teaching material and academic uh, material on the one business side. And uh, we now, you know, uh, have, uh, uh, have students who come literally from all over the world. Uh, uh, and we send students uh, as part of their training to go to see uh, other places in the world. Uh, like Chile and Argentina and uh, New Zealand, uh, etc. For that area, now we are creating, we have a master's in the wine business. Not too long ago, uh, I met this uh, young woman uh, whose father is probably the principal distributor of wine uh, in the Midwest, based out of Chicago. And, uh, she uh, the young woman had gone to school, I think, at Brown University and wanted to work for his father. And he says, uh, now, uh, you uh, uh, first uh, go get to know something in the finance world. And I think she was working with one of the major finance companies in, uh, in San Francisco. And then she sa he said, uh, if you want to work for me, I think you need to go and get a master's degree. In, in wine business at Sonoma State. Then I might consider uh, hiring, <laughs> uh, uh, etc. And again, uh, a, a, a very simple, a very different kind of uh, paradigm. And the last piece of that, uh, in that reorientation for the community, uh, <coughs> is the uh, uh, creation of the Green uh, Music Center, which will open. October 29, I mean September 29 uh, of this year. Uh, uh, with, uh, and, and again, it will be a place uh, who will attract uh, uh, not just uh, great symphonies, uh, companies like the Santa Rosa Symphony, uh, Santa Rosa, San Francisco Symphonies, and others, but also uh, artists uh, from all over the world, people, you know names you know, and we're going to announce them on next week, but I can tell you the names are people like Long Long, the uh, Chinese pianist, uh, this guy who plays a cello quite well, and uh, Yori Ma, uh, Sophie Mutter, and others. Uh, and again, I think it, it, it will also enhance the position of uh, the university <coughs> in the area of cultural tourism, uh, something that this area is also becoming more dependent on as uh, uh, in terms of tourism and the kind of industries that are supported by that. For, that's where we are, but clearly these are difficult times for the state of California and uh, uh, we will be trying to work ourselves out of that. But we don't have, at this moment, from the political side, uh, higher education doesn't have the same level of interest and commitment as a priority training its, its educated workforce as we probably had in previous years. And we're not seeing uh, higher education as being the priorities that I think uh, we should. But we keep working. Is that one wonderful? Do you have any questions? I knew we would. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Dr. Arneon. Um, I think, from what you said, I think I'm going to have to stop my contributions to the Green Music Center and instead give it to the Toilet paper. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we know by toilet paper. As <laughs> a so matter of fact, I, I know you have a question, but I can give you a reason. When I got inaugurated as president in 90, in, uh, became president in 92, but you don't get inaugurated until almost a few months, several months later, one of my closest friends sent me as a gift 
a big bot on the other thing, which I immediately was put to use. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, as tuition goes up, uh, so does student debt. Uh, I'm familiar with this because I teach at Sutter, where we have the uh, medical, uh, medical resident program. And there isn't a one of them does, that doesn't have government loans that exceed $170,000 to $200,000. And of course, this in consequence affects when they finish their residency, they're going to have to charge more. I mean, they have to pay off these debts. And so uh, everything has an effect, so increase in tuition likewise. And so it, it is a profound problem, I feel. Right. And, and, and it is, and it has. Uh, but it needs to be differentiated. The debts of the students in the California State University in Curve is among the lowest in the entire country. Our students at the end of uh, their education probably have about eight to ten thousand dollars in debt versus the students who go to other institutions, especially as they go into a medical program where the where you see these figures, which are totally correct, $100,000. At the California State University, uh, like I said, the average is less than $10,000. Why? Because the students who are in need, have need, California has three great advantages. One is the federal financial aid through what is called the Pell Grant, yeah. which provides that the students, I think, about $5,500 a year from the federal government. California has, of its own, a program of financial aid called the Cal Grants. And there's two different Cal Grants, a Cal Grant A, Cal Grant B. Cal Grant A is based upon uh, need and Calgram B is a combination of need and uh, merit. And on top of that, local to, uh, to the California State University, every time we have a fee increase, we take a third of that fee increase and we put it in financial aid. Therefore, when you hear that a student pay uh, $400 more, uh, I only got uh, two-thirds of that. The other third goes back to the students in financial aid. Unique in the United States, where a system of public higher education takes such a heavy percentage of their <coughs> increases, and plows it back into financial education. And fourth, locally, we also have a very strong program of uh, local financial aid in the form of scholarships. I see uh, my good friend here, Steve Carroll, who is one of the funders of one of those scholarships uh, for students. Therefore, if you are, if you are in a family who makes about $100,000 or less, you do not see any increases in cost of education for us. That's pretty high. You're in a family between 80 and 100, because it depends on the number of children you have, etc. But if you're in a family who has a a income of about between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars, basically your student goes to a California State University for free. There and that's something most people don't really know because of these four different aspects of education. Therefore, 
the, no, the, the amount of uh, amount of students that the students need to get into debt is in Cal for the California State University is quite quite uh, uh, moderate, and it is the best investment they can. Make. I'm telling you because I went through school with financial aid. When I came to the United States, my parents were not allowed to come. I had nobody who would support me, for I went to school. Uh, literally, there was a program, a unique program, that the federal government had for Cuban refugees, uh, called the Cuban uh, Refugee Loan Program. And that's what I went to at the University of Texas. It was a loan program. It was not a grant program. I was what uh, financed my education at the University of Texas, and, uh, and I can tell you all those uh, loans were paid. Uh, and it now I this is back in nineteen late in the late sixties. I used to go to school uh, on five hundred dollars a semester, uh, and I lived pretty well except for the last couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> and then I was, I was known to be a heavy consumer of, of sardine sandwiches. <laughs> I was a Philly and cheap uh, until the next uh, uh, loan came through. But, uh, no student uh, who really wants to go to school really is, uh, is not able to go to school at a California State University because of finance. In the um, in the California State University system, do out of state students pay higher tuition? Yes, they do. They how, pay. Does, how does this affect your admissions selection process? Uh, we we have a target that we are have uh, have to meet, which is based only on California residents. Therefore, if we have students coming from somewhere else, it is in addition to that part. Uh, and, you know, we have some, I would say probably out of a student body of about 8,200, I think we probably have about 400 who are from out of California, not a great deal. And everybody's trying to chase those students. Uh, because they pay more, uh, and but I'm not sure so that's the right public policy to follow. That's for where it, where it, a, a state university is. But it, yeah, they pay instead of paying six thousand, they pay almost uh, double uh, if you are from out of state or foreign. State. Still a good bargain compared to other places. Dr. Arbignan, I'm always curious about whether certain famous private quotations actually happened. Sounds like <laughs> Among music lovers, you are best known for one quote. Is it true that the whole idea of the Green Music Center began when you were sitting in a concert hall in Tanglewood, Massachusetts, and said to your wife in Corrick Brown, Quote, we could have all this with no humidity and no bugs. <laughs> it is an actual quote. <laughs> <laughs> it is an actual quote. And uh, my wife and I uh, were at Tanglewood, which is the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, at a new hall uh, uh, called the Osawa, Seiji Osawa. Uh, home. And uh, part of the genius of that hall was that it had both an inside, uh, I think the, at, uh, at Osawa they have a shy of 1100, and then the front doors opened totally like a hangar, uh, uh, etc. And then you can, and then you can sit on the lawn uh, uh, and, and, and hear the, the, what goes inside with almost all, the 
the same level of great acoustics as you were being inside. Mm -hmm. We were inside. And after that, uh, we went outside. And the people I was with, I was a, a, a dealing with a seminar and about the, uh, the, uh, the liberal arts. And uh, we had a, a, a picnic outside and listened to part of the music from the outside. And I was really, really impressed. And I said uh, uh, to my wife, uh, Dad, I want one of those. <laughs> uh, because you can do that in Sonoma County, who in the summer is has almost perfect weather. It doesn't rain. Uh, it is fairly mild. And having lived almost all my life in the United States, in the southern part of the United States, there are no flying bugs. Uh, you know, I have never seen a roach in 20, I have lived now in California uh, 23 years. I have never seen a cockroach. I used to live in New Orleans. You could use them as skateboards. Uh, and I said, and I said to that guy, you know, I don't know how to like, transport that into Sonoma County. That's truly, or it's a real story. Um, when you look at the plan that was put together back in the 60s, one of the dreams was that the community college structure would become potentially feeders into the... Uh, how well has that worked? Not well. Uh, part of that, yes, indeed, that was the main premise. And as a matter of fact, there was even this concept that a place like... Uh, the California State University would take 70% of its students as transfer students. The, the problem has been that the community colleges, until just literally a few months ago, uh, their mission began to expand, 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 expand. And moving from the concept that they would be principally a transfer institution to do all sorts of other things. Uh, more uh, technical instruction. I mean, if you look at their mission, is uh, probably about 20, 30 different activities. And their funding was not and it did not encourage or support the transfer program. Uh, you got paid in the community colleges what is the same as in K-12, something called the average daily attendance. And it didn't matter, you know, in what program you were attending. You could be attending the transfer program, or you could be attending the uh, programming, automotive, engineering, whatever it is. It didn't matter. And of course, in many cases, a transfer program is more expensive. Therefore, they have no incentive to do that. Um, and many students come to the community come to a community college with the intention of doing, of transferring, and then they bog down, and they don't do that. And those who transfer, come to us with too many hours. Again, there's no incentive, there have been no incentive to, because they can only transfer 60 hours. Most of the students who come to us from community college come with over 80 hours. For if you are going to defend, that is changing. There's a new law passed this year in which students would get engaged still in its native space, uh, who would uh, only take 60 hours, the, the, the state universities will have to accept those, no questions asked, and uh, there will be a very clear path of transfer. Uh, but the number of transfers to come is not as strong as they should be. I'll give you an example. Senator, I have a greatest admiration for Santa Rosa Junior College. Uh, in, in physically, 
it looked like a campus in the Northeast. I mean, I, I think that they copied from some place in Massachusetts uh, more than anywhere else. They kept the name Junior, because, and at one time, they were a enormous transfer institution uh, primarily to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. That's what they are, you know, Berkeley are the bear, Carl Bear, uh, the San Rosa JC are the cops, uh, etc. <laughs> they have an average daily attendance of about 38 to, I think, the, you, it got to be on, over 42,000 now, it's about 38,000 in this country. When it comes to students who, are, who transfer every year right away, that number is about a thousand a year. <coughs> and they are among the best. You know, therefore, uh, and again, it has been incentives, uh, it has been lack of proper counseling and lack of us at the, uh, uh, on the other side uh, accepting their coursework with no questions asked uh, and making it difficult uh, to accept them. Now, other states have figured that out a long time ago. My first job, I did some work uh, on what well, was then the junior college uh, movement, etc. I have to tell you, states like California, like Florida, um, uh, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Texas, uh, the Carolinas, etc., figure out this issue of offering a transfer degree, where the Associate of Arts degree was a strictly a transfer degree, and that transfer became very efficient. In California, until literally this year, you can get an associate of arts degree on any subject. It didn't have that transfer beam. That is going to change and we're not they're establishing a, an associate of arts in transfer studies who will regularize that. But it, it, in California, it has not worked as well as it should. We're trying to remedy it, but it's going to be better. I'd like to ask you something um, uh, about the college uh, dropouts, um, and it's so high. Number one, do you have any statistics about how many of those dropouts return to college later? And do you have any statistics or any information about why are, what are the reasons for the dropouts? Um. Let me give you some uh, figures. Uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the number of students who do not complete a bachelor's degree in a four-year period is about uh, a nationwide uh, in public education is uh, about 60 percent who do not. By the time they get to, to the sixth year, which is if they know how to measure six years better than four, it goes down to about half. Uh, we are better. Uh, Sonoma State, uh, our numbers are in the high 60, almost 70 percent of our students graduate in that period. Why do they uh, drop out many, many different reasons, some of which are uncontrolled. The primary reason in many cases, especially students who come to a residential college away from their home, etc., is Their wishes to have to keep a a relationship going. Those 
pesty boyfriend and girlfriend <laughs> who did not come there. Mm. And they, you know, something happened. Major issue. Hard to control. <laughs> but it's a major, major issue. Yeah, Second to, to that is uh, cost. A lot of students <coughs> drop to make money. And many of them, once they do that, don't necessarily want to come back until later, etc. Interestingly enough, there is an inverse correlation between cost and dropout. The higher the cost, the smaller the dropout. Mm -hmm. Nobody drops out of Princeton. Ah. Nobody drops out of Harvard. Unless you are Steve Jobs uh, Steve Job or Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> but when the cost is so low, sad, you have other alternative in it. We have seen, and, and Lots of people are, are having a hard time with this faculty primarily. The higher cost you are, the students stay. And the earlier they graduate. Because it costs too much to hang out. <laughs> you know, that's another one. The third issue is lack of fit. Um, we have students uh, who come here from more urban areas, and you know, they say there's not enough things going on uh, here. In order to go to many of the clubs, etc., we have to go to San Francisco, uh, etc. But you have that the fit, and especially if you have grown, and that happens a lot with our minority students, most of which come from or urban backgrounds, that's, uh, uh, they miss uh, that. Uh, many, but a lot of students do find them, especially when the economy turns sour, the number of people who return to education increases. I mean, we are an anti-cyclical industry. The economy goes down, our demand goes up. People have, it's a place to go, it's a place to do something, a place to return, etc. When the jobs are really available, there's a lot, you can afford to not compete. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a complex thing. And we could do more. Uh, one of the concerns that I have had is, is as, as, as we became more lenient, the level, the lack of intrusion when a student begins to have problems and the ability to call you in and say, we notice that you're not shipping up for class. We notice that you're, you know, something is going on, etc. And confront that individual, what's going on, etc. You know, as we became less local parentis, you know, then uh, we have we don't take attendance. I tell you, one of the biggest issues that you will go to school is if people know you're going to go there, your name just check off. As we don't do that, people therefore people fail because and probably because we don't chase after them enough. We're not intrusive enough. But it goes, you know, and that's again beginning to change, uh, etc. One of the things at Sonoma State, as we remain relatively you know, at 8,000, we're, we're, we're medium sized compared to if, 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 And most of our classes are, you hear about huge classes, we don't have huge, most of our classes are not huge because simply the room doesn't allow. That like over 35 students, etc. And I haven't figured out how to ex have these walls that expand. You know, my concrete walls don't expand. But if you don't show up to class, 
common also in Southern Cross. Versus at uh, Maharshal University, you have no idea who's in there except for uh, size also have to do with a little bit. Dr. Thank you for the